I wanted to introduce myself um, and get started. Um, I have, I'm Connie Kehoe. I have the honor of serving the village of Irvington as trustee and deputy mayor. Um, I'm going to real quickly get in just a moment to our three speakers, John, John, and Janice. Um, and they're listed in your program. So I want to make sure you all have this yellow sheet. Looks like this. Um, which will simplify our introduction to our speakers. Does anybody not have one of these? Okay, well, you, while that's getting settled, if you don't have one, Sue has them there with her. Um, I just want to give you a little background on the, the reason that the Irvington Housing Committee exists and why the members um, of that committee organized this forum um, and the village of Irvington sponsored it. Shall I speak any louder or are we good? Fine. Good, okay. Um, so those, in fact, the people who are on this committee actually have little name tags like this. Karen and Deb, you met coming in and Sue is back there. Um, so if you see someone with a name tag like this, know they're on the committee um, and have been meeting uh, frequently um, uh, over, actually, this committee was formed in 2013. Um, everybody on this committee is a volunteer and actually we're always open to interested possible new members. If you have some interest before uh, you all leave today, feel free to speak to any of the members or me or um, eventually show your interest. Um, the, but you might, if you were going to volunteer for such a committee, you might wonder what their task is, what their goal is, what the Board of Trustees asked this committee to do starting in 2013. And I think the easiest way for you to know what this committee does that organized this day is for me to quickly read to you the mission of this committee. And it is that the mission of the Irvington Housing Committee is in order to further the achievement and advancement of local and regional needs, the Irvington Housing Committee is determined to make and keep housing available to moderate income individuals and families, including seniors and people with disabilities, in order to make Irvington a more diverse and vibrant community. Now, given the recent property tax increases for some residents, we organized today's presentation so that everyone in the village would have some basic information regarding possible ways, strategies, approaches, tools that would either reduce your property tax or provide income to partially counter the new property tax burden. So it's my hope that you'll get ideas today. You'll get ideas from this forum and then it would be your responsibility to follow up to determine if any of these ideas in detail will help your particular circumstance. So, some quick notes. Um, this forum is aimed primarily at Village of Irvington property owners. If you happen to not be in the Village of Irvington, you don't have to leave, we're happy you're here, but some information simply won't apply to you. It's part of the Village of Irvington code. Um, Um, I would also like to say that um, on this program here, you will see that we're planning to conclude by 3 o'clock. Um, there is actually another program that comes in here. We don't have to leave absolutely at 3, but, you know, we can't linger too long in this room. Um, there'll be ways for you to follow up, and I'm sure everyone will have time to do that. Um, 
I also, um, I guess the best thing to, the best way to say that, that this is a, certainly a public forum, um, and there is, there's a serious question and answer section at the end of the three presentation. Um, but you'll see on the front page at the bottom of the front um, that um, we'll make every effort to give you accurate information, but um, this program can't um, actually be the answer to your particular circumstance. Um, but if you, if you read that, that, that should be clear. Believe me, we're going to do everything we can to provide accurate, helpful information to you today. Um, so our ABLE panelists <laughs> who are here, John, John, and Janice, I don't want to say the three J's here as it happened, um, their information in detail is on the back sheet here. Um, I will, I will tell you a, just a, a little bit about them, and I'll also introduce Karen Schatzel, who is a committee member. She's actually going to um, be the moderator of this. So um, if, if we're going too long, she may tell someone to say less. <laughs> and when we get to questions and answers, she'll keep that process going. Um, you're also probably interested, if you haven't been here before, there are restrooms back here through that back door, but don't go beyond that door. Alarms will go off and things will happen. <laughs> but this, this, these, this door here is fine. Um, let me just say quickly that. Okay, so um, we are going to go in the order that I have them here. Um, uh, Mr. John Baker is um, from the Westchester Residential um, Opportunities, WRO, everybody calls it Westchester Residential Opportunities. And although um, Rosemary Newton isn't here today, you will see in, on the back, under the advisors to the committee, Rosemary um, is part of the Housing Action Council, and Rosemary, um, recruited John to be with us today. He has a lot of uh, background, a lot of valuable information, and you can see that um, this is primarily about reverse mortgages and home equity loans. Um, our second speaker, also a John Woolham, um, and John has a very long title in an office with a very long <laughs> name. <laughs> um, I'm gonna let you read that whole thing, but believe me, this is all part of the state of New York um, and, and relates to information about property taxes. It should be very helpful to you. Um, and finally, our very own um, resident, Janice Silverberg. Janice was chair of this committee, um, and then um, she became an elected member of the Board of Trustees on which I serve. So she's continued to have a lot of in interest and input into the issues that this committee deals with. Um, I believe that each speaker will be able to um, tell you which papers might apply and what things are available. Well, thank you for that. I am John Baker. I'm with Westchester Residential Opportunities. We're a housing uh, counseling agency. We're a HUD certified housing counseling agency. We're located in White Plains. Just out of curiosity, has anybody ever heard of our organization before? It's okay if you haven't. I know in some ways Westchester can be pretty small. Um, we've been around for about 50 years, and uh, as of very recently, so have I been around for 50 years. Um, we have a number of departments within our organization, and I'm just going to quickly go over those. I'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail. Uh, of course, we can ask questions about that later. Um, one of the programs that we run is a mortgage default prevention program where we help folks who are facing foreclosure uh, who are trying to maintain their homes. And so we have one-on-one -on -one foreclosure prevention counseling programs. And we're actually having an event next Wednesday um, at the White Plains Learning Center for folks to just walk in if they're having foreclosure issues or if you know somebody who is. And we actually have those at our office once a week as well. So we have a program that, that, that runs prevention of mortgage default. We also have a fair housing department which monitors rental sales and lending markets 
for discrimination in housing. And often that's done through a process called testing, where two individuals are sent out who are very similarly situated and they have uh, an interaction with the housing provider. That department as well is also having uh, a seminar on December 9th taking place at the Pace Law School. Uh, so I was asked to give a shout out about that event uh, that's taking up in coming up in December. We're always looking for testers. We pay them uh, to go out and visit apartment complexes if you know of anybody who might be interested. We also have a senior housing department, which is a program that I run. And that has three main areas, including senior housing counseling and a shared housing program. And also, we conduct counseling on reverse mortgages. And I'll just go over those very quickly uh, in turn. Our one-on-one -on -one senior housing counseling program primarily pertains to renters or folks who are downsizing out of their homes and they're looking to access more affordable housing options. So we try and get together with people and have a conversation about what they're looking for. We talk about income a little bit. We ask about what things might be looking, people might be looking for, where they want to be. And we make sure that we are bringing up all um, benefits that folks might be eligible for. One of those is the STAR exemption and the enhanced STAR exemption uh, pertaining to real estate taxes. So that's our one-on-one -on -one counseling area where we meet with people and that's free of charge. Uh, we do ask that you make an appointment with us at our office in White Plains. We also run a shared housing program, which is what it sounds like. If folks have housing that they're interested in sharing, we try and match them up with people who might be looking for housing. Admittedly, it is not, I see a head shaking back there, it's not uh, what everybody wants to do, it's not for everybody, uh, and that's perfectly understandable. We're not selling anything there, we just try and make the programs available to those who might be interested. Maybe it's a win-win situation and somebody might be able to find themselves in a house as opposed to a smaller studio or one bedroom apartment that they might get at the more affordable level. So. Uh, we try and speak with people about that program and we ask a lot of questions about why folks might want to be doing that and if it's a win-win we try and, and match that up and make that happen. Um, we also have other resources available uh, such as an apartment vacancy list that we put out once a week. Um, you know, Again, this is more pertaining to the rental market but it's just um, WRO staff culling things from the internet and from newspapers and things like that, and we just amalgamate it <laughs> onto one list and we make it available uh, either in our offices or um, by email to people if they're interested in getting that. So I've mentioned the one-on-one -on -one senior housing counseling and also our shared housing program. And I personally, uh, in our senior housing department, do a lot of the reverse mortgage counseling. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. And I'm going to emphasize the counselor part of what we do. We don't sell reverse mortgages. We don't have a stake as to whether you get one or not. Um, frankly, for me, the jury is still out on, on those products in general. Um, I know that there's a lot of... Uh, uh, I'll say confusion uh, about these products and maybe there's not a lot of understanding about them. So I'm just going to uh, try and illuminate folks a little bit um, on, on these products. Um, I don't know if this is too personal or not, but has anybody thought about getting one? Does anybody have one? Does anybody know? I, do, are most people like, what the heck are those things? <laughs> um, Henry Winkler, who was the Fonz has a commercial on television that some of you may have seen advertising reverse mortgage products. Uh, so um, you'll probably see more of that. Um, reverse mortgage products are a way to access part of your, of your equity as a homeowner. Um, I emphasize that it's a way to access part of your equity. A lot of times folks thinks, think that they'll be able to access all of their equity and that is not the case. Uh, it's a percentage. It's based on your age. Homeowners have to be 62 in order to get a reverse mortgage uh, and the value of your home and how much you owe on the home. Those three things will, be, will determine how much you're able to access for a reverse mortgage. I think of them as a deferred payment loan. It is that. It is a loan. You are able to access the funds immediately. 
Um, but it is something that has to be paid back when one of three things happen. Either the youngest borrower dies, or they sell the property, or they decide to move. With a reverse mortgage, the homeowner still owns the home, uh, along with all of the obligations that go along with that, maintaining taxes, uh, maintenance, uh, paying any homeowners association fees, all of those have to be kept up under a reverse mortgage. Um, there's a lot of way to use the, a lot of ways to use the proceeds. You can do whatever you want with the funds. You can buy a boat. You can take a trip around the world. But we often advise that folks use these funds to supplement their monthly incomes and to you know stretch out um, uh, their their monthly incomes and also have an emergency fund or a cushion out there. There's certain types of properties where you can get a reverse mortgage. If you have a single family home, you can get a reverse mortgage. If you're in a condo, you can get one, but it has to be FHA approved. Um, if you're in a co-op or a mobile home, those are not eligible for reverse mortgages at this time. There's a lot of ways that you can actually access the funds. You can simply have a monthly payment that comes to your checking account once a month and that can be set up so that monthly payment comes to you for as long as you live in the home or potentially the rest of your life, but generally speaking, as long as you live in your home. There are other ways to access those funds. You can say, I want $10,000 a month for the next five years, and you can put a time limit on it if you want to. You can also, and I'm being very general here, uh, you can also have a credit line that just sits out there that is similar to a home equity line of credit. Um, and then there are other sort of combinations of those types of plans where you can have a monthly payment and you can have a credit, uh, a credit line sitting out there. So it's very versatile in the ways that you access the, the money. Um, and you can change it anytime you want. So at closing, it's not set that way for the life of the loan. You can change it as much as you want and as often as you want. I think they charge, the lender will charge like $20 to do that. By law, they're not allowed to charge you more. So it's very flexible. Um, in terms of just an example of how much you can access, oh, and I would also point out that any funds from a reverse mortgage are tax-free. Um, in terms of how much you can access, I just as an example, I worked with a woman who lived in Westchester. She uh, had a home valued at $500,000, and she owned it free and clear. She was 81 years old, and she was able to access $363,000, uh, and she was able to uh, divide that uh, as, as many ways as she would like. But that's just a rough estimate of how, uh, how much of the funds are available. May How I, am I doing? May I time? interrupt you? Yes, just please. Minute. Can you hear in the back? No. no. You can all. Uh, right. I can get a little closer to the no, mic. Is this any better? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Um, okay. Why don't we just move that over? Okay. To you? How's this? <laughs> I don't want to look like I'm swallowing it. Um, so that's, that's roughly how much you can get in terms of the percentage of uh, equity that you're able to access with a home equity, uh, not a home equity, but a reverse mortgage. Um, there are some, a couple of things that I'd like to mention uh, in terms of something called set-asides. And my understanding is that reverse mortgages used to be given to people without really a check done on credit or credit scores or anything like that. And there were problems that, were, that developed in the reverse mortgage industry, similar to the forward lending industry. A Little bit of a bubble, uh, people were losing their homes. Uh, and this might be a good point to say that I've been working with reverse mortgages for about six months now. So my perspective on these products is pretty new. But my understanding is that they were given pretty easily in the past, like some types of rever or some types of regular loans. So what they try and do now is look at finances a little bit more, and they invoke something called a financial inventory tool. So when there's a counseling session, they're going to sit down with you and they're going to talk a little bit about your finances and what's happening. Uh, they're not going to necessarily look at a credit score from what I understand, but they're going to look particularly at things like the payment of real estate taxes. And if there's an issue with the payment of real estate taxes, if there's been a history of late payments, the lender is most likely going to require a set aside where taxes 
the payment of the taxes will be set aside for the entire life of the loan. So that's a significant amount of money in some cases, and it's something that may actually make a reverse mortgage not really a good idea. It wouldn't necessarily leave you anything if all the funds that you're able to access are going to pay taxes. So they're going to look at the history of tax payment, and they're also going to look at um, repairs that are necessary for the home. And if there is something like a new roof that's needed or something major like that, they're going to set that money aside as well. So just to make folks aware of those potential set-asides that are out there, um, that's something that is fairly recently been implemented, I think 2014 or 2015 for these products. Um, so as I said, there has been some, some bad press around these, these types of products, and so I think that these are some of the steps that they're trying to take uh, so that folks are going into this with eyes wide open a little bit more. Are there any questions that anybody has so far? In terms of how a counseling session goes, um, again, I work on the counseling piece of it. I'm not an originator, uh, I'm not a lender. Um, folks contact us because the counseling sessions are actually required um, as part of getting the loan, which is a little bit different from a regular mortgage. Um, and so if somebody reaches out to me looking for a counseling session, um, that can happen either over the phone, uh, it can happen in person at our office, and I've gone to people's homes before uh, in order to conduct those. Um, in terms of, of who needs to be there, definitely homeowners who are on the title need to be part of the counseling session. Um, they generally last about an hour. I try and make them as interesting as possible. They have gone for two hours and more, depending on people's questions. I'm there for as long as people will have me. Um, Anybody else who wants to come, uh, children, financial advisors, friends, uh, the more the merrier, the more who want to be in on the phone call or the session, uh, that's perfectly fine. Um, I go over the costs of reverse mortgages, including the uh, closing costs, which are significant to set up a reverse mortgage, just like they are for a regular mortgage. Um, we do a little reverse mortgage 101. We cover annual mortgage insurance premiums, which are also uh, a piece of the puzzle. How the balance of the loan grows, because there is interest charged every time you access those funds, and the potential borrower needs to be aware of that. Um, we do go over the different payment plans and what the obligations of the borrower are, i.e. to continue to pay taxes and keep up the maintenance. Um, one thing that I do mention, and I, I haven't mentioned it yet, is the potential effects on other public benefits if you have a reverse mortgage sitting out there. Um, reverse mortgage proceeds will never affect Medicare or Social Security. However, if a borrower is potentially considering accessing other benefits like food stamps or other needs-based um, benefits programs, reverse mortgage proceeds can potentially have an effect on those, and that's something that the borrower has to be aware of. doesn't mean that you can't have a reverse mortgage, but if there's a large amount of money sitting in a bank from month to month, uh, they're going to look at that, and you may be deemed ineligible because you have too much in assets sitting in the bank. So you can have a reverse mortgage. You can use it to pay bills. You just don't want huge surpluses sitting in bank accounts. Um, so, um, you know, that's, that's something that I make people aware of as well. So that's really kind of everything I had. I just really wanted to provide some factual information on reverse mortgages and maybe demystify these products a little bit. I have some brochures and some cards that are on that table over there. Uh, I am happy to answer any questions that folks might have in the remainder of the time. And uh, feel free to let me know if you have any other questions. I think we'd like to uh, keep the questions for the end of the program. So uh, we would, I, I would like to present each of the uh, speakers first, and then we'll go to questions. Um, and I'm, I'm saving one for you, okay. but I just want to say, say that WRO, or Westchester Residential Opportunities, is a very well-known agency here in Westchester, and uh, very highly thought of. So uh, I know that John will be available and willing to respond to all of your questions. 
Our second speaker has come to us uh, from a greater distance. Uh, John Wallum is from the New York State Office of Real Property Taxes, and he's going to be talking about some of the uh, property tax exemptions uh, that are available and grievance procedures. The grievance procedures are something we're just starting to learn about here in this community, mm -hmm. so I'm sure everyone will be eager to hear about it. Can I ask you to pass Absolutely. that over? Absolutely. Mr. Wallum? Thanks. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Good, good. Well, my name is John Wallum, and as Karen said, I work with the division of the New York State Department of Tax and Finance. We're known as the Office of Real Property Tax Services, and unlike the rest of tax and finance, we don't do anything to collect money for New York State. Uh, New York State does not collect a single penny of property tax. As I'm sure many of you are aware, property tax is local. You pay uh, a town, county, village, school district, special district taxes. Those are all local. And typically, you're going to be paying your bills, well, let's say three times a year. In Westchester County, there is a town and county tax bill that comes out about April 1st. Uh, the village of Irvington is a non-assessing unit. I believe your bills come out about June 1st each year. And then, of course, there are the school bills that come out September 1st each year. Regardless, as part of the state, we do have a role in property tax administration. So we issue equalization rates. We work with municipalities that do reassessments. We train assessors. We administer a software that most places use in conducting their assessment administration. So that's just a little bit of background. Uh, I will say, just so I don't forget to say this, the yellow sheet has my contact information. It's got an email address and a phone number. If down the road you have questions, feel free to give me a, a call or send me an email. What I need to point out, however, is that this has the address of DTF's office in White Plains, and I need everyone to understand DTF does not have an open office policy. So please, to save yourself some time, don't visit the office expecting to speak with me or anybody else. You, unfortunately, will not be granted access. So again, if anyone does need to contact me, email or phone is the best way to do that. So without further ado, I have a whole series of handouts over on that far table. I just want to run through some basics of what they are for your reference and then, of course, get into some of the topics that Karen mentioned. Uh, first of all, there are two documents that are very general. One is an overview of the assessment role, and the other is one about property tax bills. These are very general. I'm not going to spend any time on these now, but they provide you information as to what you can learn about your property and the basis for the property taxes you pay each year. And again, just by way of quick review, there is a, since the village of Irvington is not an assessing unit, it gave up its assessing unit status, the assessments that generate your village tax and certainly whatever town tax you may pay, in addition to county and school district taxes, are all developed from the town of Greenberg's assessment roll. The town of Greenberg publishes a tentative roll June 1st of each year that role becomes final on September 15th. And then each time tax bills are generated from that role, there's what's known as a tax roll generated, which is the basis of the bill. So again, this is going to give you information that you can learn about your property and your property's value, and also whatever exemptions you may be receiving. I'm going to leave, again, I'm going to leave this off to the side. We may refer to it or aspects of it a little later on. Just want to talk very briefly about a few state programs that are meant to deal with property tax. And actually, before I go any further, I'd just like to get a sense of the audience. How many folks here are homeowners? Okay, so virtually everybody. And by homeowners, I'm also including condominiums or cooperative apartment units. So really, we don't have any folks who are renting here. Everybody here is a homeowner. And just out of curiosity, is there anyone here 
who purchased their home after, on or after May 1st, 2015? Okay, two people. All right, reason I ask that will have to do with something about the STAR exemption program, which I'll be talking about a few minutes later. But there is a distinction now. There have been some changes in STAR we'll touch on. So that's good. The last time I did one of these, there wasn't anyone who purchased their home after that, so I didn't have to go into that aspect of STAR, but I will today. So at any rate, there are, a f there are a couple of state programs that are meant to try to help people with property tax burdens. One of these you no doubt are already familiar with, or hopefully you're aware of it. It was something called the Property Tax Freeze Program. And this is actually, 2016 is the third and final year for this property tax freeze credit. And that program is then being replaced by a successor program known as the Property Tax Relief Credit. And there is a handout on that. So essentially, the way the property tax freeze credit worked, uh, it looked at the property taxes you paid in 2013. And in 2014, it looked at the school tax component of that, and it said, OK, so long as your school district complied with the 2% New York State property tax cap, which the vast, vast majority, I believe it's, uh, I believe the figure is 97% of school districts statewide complied with that. I am not aware of any offhand in Westchester that didn't, although possibly there are. Regardless, if it did, if they did, then what would happen is the school taxes you paid in 2014 were compared to what you paid in 2013, and you got a check for the difference. In 2015, last year, that included school tax and all the municipal tax, town, county, village. Of course, you all would have paid a village tax and special district. So again, bottom line is that it looked at the amount paid, what you paid currently, and it, it gave you a, a refund check for the difference. Because the idea is that your property taxes were to have been frozen. Now the way this program worked, it was really a two-year program, but it was implemented over three years. So for school tax, this refund or this uh, t property tax freeze credit was applied in 2014 and 2015. The municipal taxes, this was taken into account in 2015 and 2016. Now, before I go into that one any further, let me just say this new program, the Property Tax Relief Credit Program, that goes into effect this year. So for 2016, there is simply a flat amount payment. Everyone in the downstate area will get $130. And because this is concurrent with the last year of this tax freeze credit program, uh, qualified homeowners will get one check covering both. So you won't get two checks, one for each program. If you get one check, it's meant to cover both. So I just want to clarify that. In subsequent years, the property tax relief credit program will be based on an income threshold and it will go up for the next three years. This program is slated to run through 2019. And essentially, it's going to be income-based with the maximum amount of income, I believe it's based on federally adjusted gross income, you can earn in a particular year is $275,000. If you earn $75,000 or less, you will get the maximum benefit. And then there are additional increments of income. I believe it's $75,000 to $150,000. 150 to 200, 200 to 275. Again, that aspect of the program will go into effect next year. And for each of those income thresholds, you will get back a percentage of the amount of star tax dollar savings that you receive. And that percentage will go up each year until it hits a maximum in 2019. That program runs out in 2019, and we'll have to see if the legislature 
chooses to extend it or adopt some sort of successor program. So these are two things that are happening at the state level, which I wanted to make you aware of. And again, there is a handout that explains these in a little more detail, 2016 property tax credit checks. So with that, I'd like to go a little bit, again, this is going to be very, very general, into commonly received or the most commonly received property tax exemptions. Certainly the most commonly received property tax exemptions is something called STAR, which stands for School Tax Relief. This is the only property tax exemption that is actually funded by New York State. All other property tax exemptions are funded locally. And by that I mean that if you are eligible for an exemption other than STAR, everyone else will pay a little bit more in, to, you know, to make up the difference in the tax levy in order for you or any other qualified recipient to receive that exemption. STAR, on the other hand, is paid directly out of the New York State General Fund. So that's the difference between the two. Essentially, STAR requires a few very, very basic uh, eligibility points. First of all, you have to own your home and you have to use it as your primary residence. You also have to, there, when STAR was initially adopted, which was back in 97, there was no income threshold. About, um, I don't remember, but I think it's about six plus years ago, an income threshold was adopted for basic STAR, which is the, uh, the version of STAR that's available to the vast majority of property owners. And that basically says that the owners can't have an income greater than $500,000. And again, that's based on federally adjusted gross income. So if you hit those points and you've applied to the assessor historically, no doubt you're getting STAR. And just out of curiosity, how many folks here know they're getting the STAR exemption? Okay, so it's virtually everybody who raised their hands before, which is good, because if you're entitled to it, you should be getting it. There is also a version of STAR for seniors, known as Enhanced STAR. And that has a slightly different set of eligibility criteria. For starters, the owners of record have to be 65 years or older, unless the owners are spouses or siblings, in which case at least one has to be 65. The income of all the owners, whether they reside at the, uh, at the property or not, cannot be more for this upcoming year of 2017, because 2016 has come and gone already, for 2017 that income threshold is now $86,000. And of course, you, it has to be your primary residence. So when you initially applied for Enhanced STAR, you had to demonstrate something that, again, that at least you and the other owners are all 65 years of age or older, and you had to apply or you had to submit some, some documentation. Typically, it's a copy of your tax return, whether that's federal or state, to demonstrate that you meet the income threshold. <coughs> Now, just one note about Enhanced STAR. I, I recommend this highly. Anyone who is getting Enhanced STAR, if you are not part of something known as the Income Verification Program, I highly recommend you contact your assessor's office. Again, your assessor's office is the town of Greenberg. They're on Hillside Avenue over in Greenberg. The assessor is Edie McCarthy. And if I'm remembering it right, the assessor's office phone number is 914-989-1520. 914-989-1520. Hopefully I'm remembering that right. Again, the reason I'm mentioning that is because you apply for all exemptions locally at your assessor's office with the arguable exception of STAR for the two gentlemen who purchased their property after May 1st, 2015. I'll go into that in just a couple of minutes. But for anyone who's getting enhanced STAR, there is a program available called Income Verification. 
If you are interested in participating in this, you cannot be turned down. And essentially, what the income verification program entails is you filling out a very simple form. It's basically providing the names of each of the owners of record, their social security numbers, and providing signatures. Once you turn that in to the assessor, the assessor will register that information on a secure part of Tax and Finance's website, and the Department of Tax and Finance will verify your income, again, this assumes that you're filing a tax return each year, with the assessor. What this saves is you, as the Enhanced Star recipient, having to submit paperwork to the assessor each year verifying that you still qualify under the income level. This allows the state to do that on your behalf. So unless you're changing residences, or unless there is some issue about your age, which of course there shouldn't be since you demonstrated that when you first applied, you would no longer have to renew the exemption. So it saves you time, it saves you paperwork. Again, I highly recommend it. And I know that the assessor's office in Greenberg welcomes people doing that because, of course, it's less administrative work for them as well. The only instance where that wouldn't be true is if, for some reason, you did not file a tax return. If you didn't file a tax return, DTF can't do anything to verify your income, and that falls back then on the assessor. So, for the two gentlemen in the audience and for anyone who purchased their home after May 1st, 2015, STAR this year went through a programmatic change. And essentially, now anyone who is applying for STAR for their home for the first time, they will now have to register with the Department of Tax and Finance to get STAR. And for folks in those instances, rather than getting STAR as a property tax-based exemption, which for everyone else you will continue to see on your school bill for as long as you own your home, those folks will be getting what's known as a STAR tax credit check. And those checks, ideally, they will have already been mailed out. The idea was that since school tax bills are due in September, uh, the idea is that they would have been, those checks would have been mailed by the end of September. Uh, possibly there may be instances due to processing where they may not have yet been received, but the department is working very judiciously to get those out as quickly as possible. So that's the big distinction there. If you have been receiving STAR as a property tax-based exemption, no change. You will continue to get it as a property tax-based exemption for as long as you continue to own your current home. If you change primary residences or if you sell your home and buy another home elsewhere in New York State, whether it's in Greenberg or somewhere else, you will then enter this tax credit check program where you will have to apply to DTF and you will still get the same dollar benefit, but you will get it in the form of a check rather than seeing it directly on your bill. So, enough about STAR. The next most common exemption is the low income senior citizen exemption. And essentially, this is a program for senior citizens, 65 years of age or older, who make less than $29,000 a year. To the best of my knowledge, Greenberg also has some local options in effect which is called the sliding scale. So that means the income can be a little bit higher, but the amount of the exemption is reduced. So right now, if you qualify for the senior citizen's exemption and you make, under, you make either at or under that threshold $29,000, you will get 50% off all your property tax. However, if you make a little over 29000 there are additional increments of income, excuse me, which allow the exemption to be reduced by 5%. And I believe Greenberg has adopted versions of this local option 
that allow this to be granted down to 5%. So in other words, if you make up to 29,000, you would get a 50% exemption. Then I believe for the next $900 in income, the benefit drops to 45% and so on. And again, I believe Greenberg has the maximum available. This would continue down to a 5% benefit. Uh, there, well, I, I think we want to take the questions later, but definitely uh, I'll answer whatever question you have if I can. So again, bottom line, this is a exemption, an exemption that you must apply to your local assessor for. What's important about any exemption other than STAR is your taxable status date, which is the, the latest date legally your exemption applications must be submitted to the assessor's office, is May 1st. So if any of you feel that you are eligible for an exemption that you do not presently receive, or if you are receiving an exemption like the senior citizen exemption, which must be renewed annually, you must get the, um, you must get your application to the Town of Greenberg's Assessor's Office by May 1st, this would be May 1st, 2017, or you will not be eligible for it until the following year. Okay. Veterans exemptions, uh, if you have served in the armed forces, basically during a period of wartime, or in a combat zone, or if you have a, a physical disability rating and you have a dishonorable discharge, chances are you're going to be eligible for a veteran's exemption. At this point, there are two active veteran's exemption. One is known as the alternative veteran's exemption, and one is the Cold War veteran's exemption. Obviously, there's a distinction in the, the time period of service for each of those. And again, just in the interest of time, I'll simply say there is a, a basic amount of exemption for having served in wartime. Uh, yes, during a period of wartime. That percentage goes up if you served in a combat zone, and there is an additional exemption if you have a physical disability rating. This is also an exemption to which you must apply to your local assessor. However, once you apply and receive this exemption, you do not have to renew it. The other point worth mentioning about both exemptions is that about three years ago at this point, the legislature expanded the alternative veterans exemption so that it now includes a benefit for school taxes if your school district has adopted a resolution to allow that. Similarly, this year, the state legislature did something similar for the Cold War veterans exemption. But again, in order to get that for your school tax, your local school district has to adopt that exemption by resolution. So just a point of information there. The last exemption I'm going to mention, which arguably is the next most common, although there tend to be relatively few occurrences of this particular exemption in any given municipality, is something for folks who have a physical disability and have a low income. The reason we really don't see too many of these is very often, although by no means exclusively, many of the folks who might qualify for this are also over 65, and by law, you can only receive the senior citizen's exemption or the exemption for persons with disability. You cannot get both. But effectively, this has the same income thresholds. You can't make more than 29,000, and the law specifies certain criteria by which the disability must, must be defined. It's got to conform to the way it's defined in the law. There are certain laws it references. I don't have that memorized, but if anybody needs that, I can certainly get that for you. And again, that also works on a 50% basis, and there is also an, a local option, just like the senior citizen's exemption, to expand that decreasing increments of benefit down to 5% based on increments of income that exceed 29,000. So 
I'm going to leave exemptions alone at this point. I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about your assessments because, frankly, in the general scheme of things, that's probably the most direct thing that any of you as property owners can do to ensure your property tax is fair and you're not paying more than you feel you should. Uh, I know some people may disagree with me when I say this, but you actually are fortunate in that the town of Greenberg just did a reassessment. The town of Greenberg last did a reassessment, I believe it was in 1958, which just happened to be the year I was born. <laughs> Uh, and, and Greenberg by no means takes the prize. There is a city in Westchester County that last reassessed prior to the Civil War. So the thing here is, the best way I can say this is whether any of us here would agree with this or not, property tax in New York, in virtually all the states in this country, and in most countries in this world, property tax is based on the value of your property, plain and simple. So the bottom line here is if the assessment role, which is the mechanism from which your property taxes are generated, does not reflect an accurate value for your property and everyone else's, chances are you're not going to be paying the right amount. And the thing about not doing a reassessment, just to put in a plug for that, everyone each year has the ability to grieve your assessment. However, uh, let's, let's think about this for a minute. People who grieve their assessments typically do that because they think their assessment, and I want to be very clear about this, you may think you're paying way too much in the way of property tax, but you can't grieve your taxes. The only point you can grieve legally is the value of your property. Very, very important distinction. Many people go in saying their taxes are too high. The Board of Review will say we can't help you. You have to look at your property's value. And the good thing here is in Greenberg, whether you agree or disagree, you now have an assessment role that represents the town's opinion, current opinion, of your market value. And that is a heck of a lot easier for you to deal with than a value from an assessment that's almost 60 years old. So that's the good news. Now the other good news here is if you take a look at that handout I referenced earlier, the overview of the assessment role. All assessment roles are by law required not only to include your assessment, but to include the implied market value. Another bit of good news is that Greenberg is now assessing at 100% of value. So your assessment and your implied market value are one in the same. There's no mathematics to interpolate what does my assessment mean. If you have an assessment of 400,000, that means the town's opinion of your value is 400,000. And let's also be clear about what that means in terms of time. Because I'm sure since virtually everyone here is a homeowner, you've all had the experience at one point in time of getting an appraisal. And for those of you who remember that, you will probably remember the first thing the appraiser asks is, okay, what is the date as of which you want me to set this value? That's known as the valuation date. And assessors, municipal assessors, have the same obligation. Value is always something that can change, and it will change. So that's why every assessment role published in New York State has a valuation date. For the town of Greenberg, that valuation date is July 1st of the preceding year. So the assessments that were published on the town's 2016 roll represented value as of July 1st, 2015. For your upcoming roll, which again is going to be published June 1st, 2017, that's your next tentative roll, when you look at that, that's going to represent a value as of July 1st, 2016. So that's the date as of which you have to measure, is this a reasonable market value? And what's the best way to do that? The best way, plain and simple, is to look at sales. Because certainly for residential property, and I assume everyone here owns a residence, I, I assume we're not talking about any commercial property owners here, 
the courts recognize that comparable sales or sales of other property is the best and most accepted way of determining value of other residential property. So the best suggestion I can make is to take a look at properties that have sold within a reasonable time frame around that valuation date, which again, for your upcoming 2017 role, is July 1st, 2016. You want to try to look at sales of property that are similar to yours, the same building style, ideally in the same school district, if not in the same neighborhood, roughly the same size. The more similarities, the more physical similarities between your property and the comparable sales, the better a case you can make that the values you're seeing represent a reasonable way of estimating your own property value if you were to go to sell it. Now, if you think your property's assessment is reasonable, well, you don't have to do anything further. If, on the other hand, you think that it's high, and let's be honest, nobody, it, it's, I've yet to meet anybody who went in to say my property value is too low. If you think it's too high, the first thing that I would suggest you to do is to go in and speak with the assessor's office. If you are able to present reasonable documentation to which the assessor agrees, the assessor has the ability to enter into what's known as a stipulation. And that stipulation is something which presumably would reflect a lower number to which you and the assessor both agree. You don't have to do anything further, and that number is ratified by the Board of Assessment Review. If, on the other hand, you and the assessor don't have a meeting of minds about the value of your property, well, you have the option of deciding whether to file a grievance. Grievance in the town of Greenberg will always be the third Tuesday in June of each year. There's only one day each year you can grieve your property formally. Again, the third Tuesday in June. I don't remember what the date is for 2017, but it is the third Tuesday in June. And there will be a form you will need to fill out in which you will have to state what your opinion of the market value of your property is. And you will need to provide the best documentation you can offer to substantiate your opinion of value. Because, of course, you want the board to agree with you rather than the assessor. Some people will go get an appraisal of their property. That is not required. If you feel that's necessary, that is an option. Obviously, that's going to cost you several hundred dollars. But not, not everyone chooses to do that, and there is no requirement to do that. But again, if you're going to take a look at the value of your property, certainly the most compelling evidence is the value of other comparable sales. And I know we're on a time schedule here, so I'm just going to leave it at that. And Obviously, I'll be happy to answer any questions afterwards, whether it's in the group or privately afterwards. Thank you very much, Jeff. That was very comprehensive. I, I'm going to ask you then to move the, uh, I think you can all hear me anyway. Yeah. And uh, Janice Silverberg will be our last speaker, and she's going to be speaking about some of the local options that you have. Thank you. Mine will be the shortest, I promise. Um, I live here, so I know why we're all here. We're all here because Greenberg's reassessment, however it, good it was in the big picture, affected lots of people in this community with huge increases in their taxes. Sorry. Is this better? Okay. The board has worked very hard to try and do whatever we can to help residents through this process, including supporting the phase-in, and we have the distinction of being the village that really helped the highest percentage of residents um, apply for the phase-in of the taxes. As you heard, we didn't, the village did not set these taxes. This was based on Greenberg's reassessment, but you are all affected by it. So the can purpose of this back? panel. Can you hear in the back? No. Yes. No. All right. Will you speak up? Just hold it a little closer. I, I have a hearing aid, but I can never hear you guys either. Okay. My, my kids never say that. I don't understand. 
So the purpose of this panel was, again, it's informational. We're not suggesting anything. We wanted people to be aware of what your options are. We wanted you to be, have all of the information about the taxes, what tax mitigation possibilities there are, and other ways that you might be able to get some relief, some financial relief. And one of the ways that our first speaker spoke about was um, reverse mortgages. Again, not for everybody, but it's one possibility. I'm here to talk about the possibility of generating income from your home. This is, let me, it was said at the beginning by Connie, but this is very specifically Village of Irvington. These three options are based on the village code. If you are a school district resident or live in one of our neighboring villages, you need to check your local code. But for Village of Irvington residents, there are three ways that you can think about getting some, some income from this house that you're now paying more taxes on. And I'm particularly pleased to be talking about this strategy because I was part of the Irvington Housing Committee when the proposals for accessory apartments and in-law apartments were presented to the board and the board did adopt those recommendations so it's now part of our village code. And both of the recommendations flowed from the mi mission of the Irvington Housing Committee, which Connie um, read out at the beginning of this presentation. But basically, it's always talked about both sides of the equation. Having more affordable housing options for people who might otherwise be priced out of the village, but also helping residents who are having negative financial issues, of whatever kind, including higher taxes, to be able to use their homes in creative ways and stay in the community. So these are all permitted by Village Code. One of them has been on the books for a long time. And by the way, the Village Code is available online. Go to Village of Irvington, hit a button, the entire code, type in whatever part of it is of interest to you, and it's right there for you. So first, the first option is to have borders. Again, this is not for everybody. But the Irvington Code sets forth as a permitted use in single family homes the renting out of not more than one room. By the way, I've summarized all of these options in a handout that's available on the table which you can pick up uh, when you leave. Um, there is no special permit or application necessary. This is a use as of right in a single family home. This code is silent about whether the border may have kitchen privileges. Basically, the particular arrangements are left to the homeowner and the border, but not a separate kitchen. This is not considered a separate apartment or a separate dwelling unit. It's somebody, you're renting out a room in your home. The possibilities would include renting out, you might, again, if you're downsizing, empty nester, you might consider a master bedroom with an ensuite bathroom a bedroom on a lower level, or simply renting out a be bedroom with access to a hall bath. The degree of contact between the border and the homeowners is also left to your discretion. I've given contact information for two possibilities. Again, these are just possibilities to give you an idea what's out there. There's an organization called EF, which um, places students who are in the United States learning English they seek to place those students with families where they will have an opportunity to converse. So obviously, the expectation will be that you're talking to your board, having meals with them possibly, but that's w certainly one option. On the other side of the spectrum, Mercy College, um, the, the dorms there can be a little bit beyond the reach of students who have an onerous commute, and it's a possibility that you might be able to make a match with a, a Mercy College student who will want little more than a place to sleep and possibly not even on the weekends because their basis of their social life is on the campus. And I have a contact information for that as well. Okay, next you can designate a portion of your home as a separate apartment, and there's two ways of doing this. It can be either an in-law apartment or an accessory apartment. In-law in apartments are now, based on the board's adoption of the recommendation of the Irvington Housing Committee, the board amended the code to include in-law apartments as a permitted use in single family homes. In-law apartments are a separate living area which may include a kitchen, so it can be a fully full apartment, You've got, you can have a bedroom, living room, bathroom, kitchen. For the use of a family member 
or a caregiver and his or her family. The family is defined broadly as people related by birth, marriage, or adoption, and the board expanded the list of permitted occupants to include caregivers and their families. One requirement of this type of apartment, there must be, and I'm quoting, an unobstructive passageway between the main dwelling and the in law apartment. That doesn't mean you have to share space, just that there has to be an unobstructed passageway. And the two dwellings must share common water, sewer, and electric facilities. So, for example, such a unit could exist in a finished downstairs as long as the staircase is not blocked off. The in-law apartment must be in the main house, not, not in an outbuilding, but the homeowner may occupy either the main house or the apartment. Again, we tried to envision people, empty nesters, people who were, who were retiring, where there's a drop in income, where they perhaps have just way too much house now. They would like to continue to own the house. They love living here. They like the house. But maybe they would like to rent out the larger portion of the house and move into the, the finished downstairs. Perfectly permitted. They are not considered separate dwelling units by law, and thus they are not subject to the same state building code requirements. It's simply another permitted use of your single family home. You have to register with the village clerk, comply with all the requirements that are on the application form, and have a statement from the building inspector, basically that your, your home is in compliance with the building codes, not that anything special is necessary for the um, in-law apartment. There is a $50 fee. That's it. Now, accessory apartments. This is something completely different, newly adopted. This is a different section of the code. These are designed to be self-contained, separate dwelling units and may be located either in the principal residence or an outbuilding on your property, not, however, a garage. Apparently, very few things are allowed in garages historically in Irvington except for your car, not garages, but any other kind of outbuilding or within your, your home. No exterior changes which alter the character and appearance of the single family home. You're not turning your house into a two family home. You, have it, you are having a separate accessory apartment that is part of your single family home. Accessory apartments can be no more than two bedrooms and the home must have been in its present size for at least five years. Basically, this precludes someone from um, buying a home with a notion of immediately expanding it to include a rental generating apartment. The intent of adopting this was to create an opportunity for current homeowners to set up an accessory apartment within, within their existing homes. The owner must occupy the single family home, but again, as with in-law apartments, you can live, the owner can live in either the principal dwelling or the accessory apartment. To set up the accessory apartment, you must submit an application to the village, as well as professional, architectural, and site plans, demonstrate compliance with state and village building codes, and have an inspection by the Irvington Building Department. The application must be approved by the planning board, so you have to go through the planning board process, and the planning board will, among other things, consider the effect on the character of the neighborhood, including parking, traffic, noise, and congestion. The planning board can issue a permit if it does for up to three years. There is a $250 application fee and a $100 renewal fee. No more than 50 such apartments may be in existence at any one time. Again, we were looking not to change the character of the village, but to have this specific income generating means on the books for those of you who can take advantage of it. It is important to note that accessory apartments are considered separate dwelling units and thus must comply with the New York State Uniform Fire Prevention and Building Code requirements. That's not anything we can do anything about. This is, this is New York State law. And these include, for example, a requirement that egress doors be a minimum of 36 inches in width. And honestly, because we, we spent a lot of time looking at this, this is going to preclude a lot of the finished downstairs that initially seemed like, oh, this is perfect, this will work. It has to be a 36 inch wide egress door and the ceiling minimum six foot eight inches. With no wiggle room on that. The, the state code controls this. So again, this is not for everybody, but if you can do this in your home or you're willing to put in 
you know, some renovation to put in a wider door, this could definitely be a possibility. And this would be a completely separate dwelling unit. You don't have to be related to the people. You don't have to have any interaction with them whatsoever. You have an apartment in your home or your outbuilding that you are getting rental income from. Again, there's a one-page summary of all of these three options on the table. Thank you very much. And I think we're going to now go to questions. All right. Thank you. I, I'm sure you all agree there's been a lot of information given this afternoon. For those of you who feel that you'd like to leave, please do now. However, we will open it up to questions uh, from the audience. And I would ask you, if you are leaving, please help yourself to documents over on the table and just look over everything there. But please try to keep your conversations outside so that it doesn't feed back into the audience. Uh, I will bring a, a microphone out to each of you if you want to ask a question. And uh, I would ask you, please, to make your question as general as possible. Please don't say, I have done this on my house and so forth and so on, unless it might apply to other people in the audience. Uh, and again, all, all right, thank you. Nick? Thank you. And again, if at all possible, if you would confine your questions to one minute. Mm -hmm. I know that's tough if you have an explanation you have to make. Question, all right. May I pass this over to you? That'd be good to state your name if you could. Please, yes. Hi, I'm Laurie McGuire. I have uh, two questions for John uh, Wilhelm. Uh, the first is, um, do, did, do you know if Greenberg used the software that you mentioned, uh, the assessment software that's administered by your office? You said most municipalities use it. Could you hear her question? Yes, Thank I could. You. The question, I'll just repeat it, was whether Maybe the I'm not tower of Greenberg I have another question uses now. the assessment yes. administration software that's, that's uh, developed and supported by New York State. And the answer to that is no. The town of Greenberg uses a private software known as PASS, which uh, I believe is in use uh, 30, 40, 50 municipalities. About, probably about half the places in Westchester use that and some elsewhere too. Is that administered by Tyler Technologies, or is that a, a, se a separate software? The follow-up question was, is that administered by Tyler Technologies? I have an actual question, I'm sorry. And, okay, uh, this is a, a little complicated answer. The we assessment the now, because it won't go on the video. Uh, Not that okay. we can hear, uh, but the uh, video uh, can't uh, hear. Thank you. Okay. okay. Good point. Thank you, Kyle. <laughs> okay. Good idea. Thank you. So, okay, just to repeat briefly, the question was about the software that the town of Greenberg uses. The answer to cover both questions is that Greenberg, for assessment administration purposes, uses a software known as PASS, P-A-S. It is not the state software. There is no requirement that they have to use the state software. Relative to Tyler technology, the valuation for the town of Greenberg's project was done using software which is owned, developed, and supported by Tyler Technologies. I believe the name of that software is IAS World. So that's where the data was collected, that's where the valuation was performed, but the valuation information was brought back to the town's pass system for purposes of generating the 2016 roll. Well, I, I can just repeat the question if you like. Um, you described the grievance process, um, and you mentioned that uh, you can meet with the assessor, that that would be a good way to go. And then if that didn't work out, you would file a grievance. Right. Many of our neighbors, and us included, and this isn't specific to us, but we went ahead and filed a grievance. We were advised to do that you know, by an attorney. Sure. And other people in our neighborhood that we were compared to, so our comp, and this is not particular to us, this happens to many people, met with the assessor's office, and their valuations were dropped. So now the paperwork we put in was very different from what our comp now got. Do you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. we thought, okay, well, this must be the value since our comps have X value. But now our comps have X minus 20% because ED made this deal across the table with them. And our paperwork is now completely inflated. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious about that. The processing is very broken. 
Okay, to try to summarize the question, and, if, and hopefully, if, hope, let me know if, I'm, if I got it accurately. Essentially, the question deals with a situation where a grievance was filed based on assessment information available at the time of the filing of the tentative role. And when your grievance was actually heard by the Board of Assessment Review, it turns out that the board, or, or I'm sorry, not the board, but that the assessor, in terms of dealing with individual property owners, had made stipulations, which is entirely, that's entirely legal. There's nothing wrong with that. But consequently, the documentation that some property owners submitted to the board wasn't, I don't want to say it wasn't valid, but it no longer reflected some of the values that were used to develop the case that, that you presented. And I, yeah, I, I, there, I, don't, I don't know of anything in the laws governing grievance that cover that, to be quite honest with you. I think in the case of an initial reassessment, which again, this was done in, Grie in Greenberg last, well, 58 years ago, I don't want to be dismissive and say sometimes things like this will happen, but I suspect that's what exactly what you experienced. The follow-up, I would say, is certainly anyone who does not get the decision they expect or would desire from the grievance board has the option of filing a small claims assessment review. And I would say that if you feel that your property is not worth the amount that the, that the town set, that would have been the next option. There is a filing fee of $30. I, if I'm remembering right, because this is administered by the Office of Court Administration, not DTF, the application for that has to be submitted within 30 days of the filing of the town's final roll. And then at a certain point, based on the scheduling of these, uh, however many are filed, your case will come up to a small claims assessment review hearing officer who may or may not be a judge, may, may be someone hired by the Office of Court Administration with a lot of knowledge about real estate, who will hear your perspective and will also hear the assessors. Obviously, the assessor is going to defend her value in this case. But certainly, to the best of my knowledge, there would be nothing preventing you at that point from preparing revised documentation that would take that into account. My recollection of the process is you cannot ask for anything less than you asked for on your grievance filing. Yeah. 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 No, that that is something in the law. So the the only thing I could advise you there is if ultimately you don't get a result that you find satisfactory for the, from your uh, scar hearing from 2016, you certainly could and should look at how those values are for the 2017 tentative role. And there again, you'll, you'll just want to go through the same process. Thank you. You're welcome. Questions? Anyone have any questions? Uh, in that case you gave of the woman who had a $500,000 free and clear home, she applied for a, uh, a reverse mortgage and got $363,000. Why would she have not been better off just getting a mortgage on that property, having less paperwork and, and maybe even saving money in the net cost of it? So, so, so if I understand correctly, um, in the scenario that I mentioned where the person um, had a $500,000 home, she owned free and clear, she was able to access $363,000. Why wouldn't she get a mortgage? So if I guess if I'm understanding the question correctly, I guess what I would say is she was looking to supplement her monthly income. Uh, from, from, are you saying from selling the home or? Getting a mortgage on that property for $300,000. She would get that money. She owned the property free and clear. 
Right. So I guess I'm unclear why why she would get a mortgage. I I, I just uh huh. I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't think I understand the question. I, are you saying a home equity line of credit? Oh, okay, all right. Okay, that, I, I thought you were saying take a mortgage out on the house where she would, okay. Um, so I'm gonna guess here, I, I think that um, maybe uh, there might be tax implications, I'm not sure. She potentially might never have to pay the reverse mortgage back if she just wants to hand over the home to the reverse mortgage. That would be my guess. Also, I think that she's thinking, I, might, I don't wanna put words in somebody's head, but I think that uh, maybe she's thinking, I'm here for the long haul, this is it. I'm gonna stay here until you know, I'm going upstairs. And this just allows me to access as much as I want, when I want, tax-free. Uh, I, I think, I, I would guess that was why she would pursue something like that. But you know, there's also costs associated with that as well. I mean, there's a cost to, a, to set up a reverse mortgage. It could be $20,000 to set one up. In terms of closing costs, yeah, and insurance to set up a reverse mortgage as opposed to a, a home equity line of credit, which I don't really have uh, facts on uh, how much it costs to set those up. And I think it might say on this program that I was gonna be speaking on home equity lines of credits and I don't really know anything about those products. So I apologize for that. So I'm really just guessing on those those pieces of it. Um, but uh, yeah, so they're expensive. And if somebody sets up a reverse mortgage and they you know leave two years later their home, that's a very expensive proposition. Um, yeah, I mean, the costs go down significantly if they stay in the home, you know, hopefully 10, 10, 12, 15, you know, much longer years. Did I answer your question in my ramblings there? Yeah, as long as you break down the Yes, I got the term mixed up, I think. It sounds like there's another question in the back. With a reverse mortgage. So the implications, um, one of the things... Sure. So the question that was asked were, what are the implications for your heirs, or for yourself, for that matter, if you get a reverse mortgage? For your heirs, if you're looking to leave the home to somebody, and for yourself, if you decide to want to move. Um, one of the questions that I'm required to ask as, as a counselor is, how is that going to affect that amount of money? Is it going to increase it, or is it going to decrease it? And Obviously, it's going to decrease it. If you're pulling funds from a reverse mortgage to supplement your living expenses, that's going to have to be paid off before your heir can get the home. Um, so it's definitely going to decrease that, and it's also going to decrease the amount if you decide you want to uh, move to another property, if you decide you want to you know, move to an apartment or what have you, or a condo. Um, the one thing that I would say is that these loans can be paid off in part or in full any time um, without penalty to reduce that amount that's owed uh, at, the, at the end of the term of the loan. Did you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, this is all great to be able to rent out a room in your house and everything else, but doesn't that affect your 1040 line 37? Push you over the eighty-five thousand dollars, and now you won't get the star exempt star. Correct. It's going to be my question. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Would uh, would you repeat I that? Sure. That's the line we're His question about on that also. Senior exemption and all. Of, it's line thirty-seven on your ten forty, right? Yeah, yeah. The the gentleman's question is about the potential effect of getting some form of rental income. <coughs> Uh, you know, through the programs that Janice described, and is it possible that that could increase your income to the point where you might not be eligible for other benefits? And I'll be the first to say I am not conversant in income tax. I just do property. But I, it, yes, it's, it's certainly a consideration. If hypothetically you're getting, well, let's say you're getting the low-income senior exemption as a property tax-based exemption, which is, of course, you know, that's a maximum of 29,000 unless the, um, the sliding scale has been adopted locally. 
if you do choose to get a border or have uh, an in-law apartment or what have you, yes, your income is going to be considered income. And certainly, whether it's DTF or whether it's the local assessor for the senior citizen exemption, and I will just point out that the way income is calculated for purposes of the senior citizen exemption is different than that for STAR and Enhanced STAR. But bottom line is, yes, if it's income, potentially it could count. So this is all part of the, the decision-making process that everybody needs to make in terms of what's going to end up the best, work the best for you individually. I wanted to uh, recognize Deb Flock in the back over there, <laughs> who had prepared um, this handout. It says property tax exemptions. And some of you have picked this up. Um, and, and my question um, is that under the senior citizen income limitations, I know, uh, John, you're mentioning 29,000 with some other um, possibilities, and the chart um, that, that Deb, I think, from speaking with Greenberg, has a different number there that is 36.4. Yeah. Maybe someone could explain I what that is. Explain that. Yeah, I think I mentioned earlier on that, to the best of my knowledge, Greenberg has adopted the sliding scale. So the figure that's being quoted there would be the upper end of income under which you can get a sliding scale benefit. Now, of course, if you're getting uh, that 36 and change figure, you're not going to be getting 50% off your property tax. You're going to be getting the reduced sum, uh, a reduced percentage. Uh, when was the sli uh, sliding scale uh, decided? And for how long it was it lasted? And uh, in the future, Okay. okay, the question was about the sliding scale for the senior citizen exemption. When was it adopted? Uh, how long will it last? What will happen in the future? The sliding scale option is something that was passed by the New York State Legislature. It is a local option, so towns, cities that offer the senior citizen's exemption, and villages for that matter, can choose to offer that. Uh, the, I don't have dates. I do know, again, this is part of the law. It's a local option, and the town of Greenberg and the village of Irvington would have had to have voted on that. When they would have done that, I don't know. As far as how long it will last, so long as that local law remains on the books in the village of Irvington and the town of Greenberg, it will continue. The only way it would potentially change is if at some point the state legislature were to change the income amounts. Uh, every once in a while, and again, I don't have any specific time frames, but uh, someone may go to the legislature or their legislator and say, look, the $29,000 income threshold to get 50% off, we think it's time that that should be increased. And when and if that were to happen, that would, of course, affect the sliding scale, because that would have to be adjusted upwards. When that happens, I have no idea. Uh, I will add one more. The amount of 29,000 of uh, about eight years ago, and $29,000 of income this year is quite different. Mm -hmm. So this income, this income level, will be same uh, for a while, uh, or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah the, the question really is about the $29,000 maximum income level in order to get the 50% reduction in taxes through the low-income senior exemption, uh, the property tax exemption. And of course, I think the question is how long is that going to last because $29,000 of income eight years ago doesn't buy as much today as it did, well, eight years ago. And again, the only answer I can give you is what I said a few moments ago. That 
amount is in state law. So that would really require the state legislature to pass something that would increase that. They would have to make a change to real property tax law 467. If that's something of interest to you, the only suggestion I could offer is for you to discuss that with your state representatives, your state assembly person and or your state senator. Uh, if I understood the question right, you're, you're saying that if you make under a certain amount, do you still have to pay school tax? The only way I can really answer that is to say that if you are eligible for the low-income senior citizen exemption, you will still pay school tax, but it will be reduced by 50 percent or by whatever amount you qualify for under the sliding scale. But yeah, there's, um, short of a property being tax exempt, I, I don't know of a way that uh, somebody really gets a complete wash on their property tax. I mean, arguably, yes, I have heard of situations where someone owns a condominium or more generally this happens with co uh, cooperative units, a, a, a co-op apartment and someone will, let's say, qualify for several exemptions, like they'll qualify for STAR, maybe a seniors, and maybe a veterans. And cumulatively, because the value of that co-op apartment is relatively low, there are some limited instances where that may exceed the value of the assessment on that unit, and then they don't pay a, a tax for school purposes. But for people who own homes, it's, uh, I don't honestly think that happens. The gentleman in the back, could you stand up and, and uh, or should I bring the microphone over? Uh, my question was on the accessory apartment. I assume if you are in an accessory apartment, the creating accessory apartment, your tax valuation is going to go up. Is that a fair assessment? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. It hasn't happened. Yeah, we, we honestly haven't had one yet. Um, I'm sorry, the question was whether if you do set up an accessory apartment in your home, your home will be evaluated differently for tax purposes? It would not be, uh, get the next reassessment perhaps, you know, but it's not going to affect your current assessment, I don't believe, but I'm gonna ask you to weigh in on that if you know. Okay, I'll try. Um, I have to say up front, I am not an appraiser, so I'm just offering, re offering you some general thoughts. I would say that it would really depend on whether the assessor felt that increased the market value of the property. And whether that increases the market value of the property, I would think, my, my layman's thinking here, is it would depend on if the property could be sold with the right for the new seller to continue to use that area as an accessory apartment. If that goes away when you sell the property, then I would tend to think the, the likely answer, though I'm not going to guarantee it, is probably no. If, on the other hand, you as the owner could sell that building and say, well, look, I have a, you know, a, a valuable commodity here because there, there can only be 50 accessory apartments in the village, and this is one of them, so you as the new owner can continue to generate some income, then I think it's, it's reasonable to think it might affect the market value of the property to some degree, but I couldn't quantify that. Just, and that one part of that I can answer. The new, if, an, if a house with an accessory apartment is so, sold, the new owner must apply for a continuation of use as an accessory apartment. And obviously, the, if that's going to push it over 50, hard to see that would happen since this is one of the group. But the new owner can reapply, so it can continue if the new owner so wishes. I, if there's a possibility of not being taxable, then that should call the value to go down because you're selling something that somebody can't use. That's you know, sort of yeah, an interesting. I, I just want to add one thing. To be fair, I think your question really would be best addressed to the assessor of Greenberg because obviously that's the person who would be making a decision on the value. So that's the person whose thinking on this matters the most. <laughs> Talking about, yeah, I mean, just even if the specifics have to go there, 
an assumption that somehow has to be weighed in the process of the the thinking on everything we've been hearing. Yes, which is why we said at the beginning of this, none of these options was right for everybody, and you know we were just trying to give you an idea of what what the possibilities are, um, but how it fits with your particular situation, you know the the best answer to many questions is always it depends. So. If there are no more questions, I would like to thank uh, the panel on behalf of the Irvington Housing Committee and also call to your attention again the addresses, the contact information is on the reverse of this sheet and remind you that as Mr. Wollum said, the office of the uh, New York State Department of Taxation and Finance in, is not in White Plains as it indicates here, he, it, it is, but it, it is not open to the public. But on the other hand, he can be contacted at the telephone number or the email address. And certainly, John Baker's office is open to the public, and he his contact information is here. And of course, we know Ms. Silverberg is available to us all. Right, and I would also, I'd like to thank Karen and the speakers and the committee members and uh, our AV folks as well. So thank you all for coming, and please follow up. Uh, again, we do have a little time for them to hang around. Thanks a lot. Help them. Help them.